Hi, I'm Todd Barton, resident composer for the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. In 2001, I heard that they had mapped the complete human genome and it was available online. And that night, uh, after a very long day of work, I went to uh, my studio to just sort of shut things down, but then couldn't resist going online and trying to find chromosome one and what that looked like. I had no idea what I was about to enter into. And I found chromosome one and started downloading and I just kept scrolling down and down and all these A, T, C's and G's and strange patterns just kept filling the screen. Um, and I thought, well, I wonder if we could, you know, find an analog to at least those four nucleotides musically. Uh, but, you know, after 10 minutes of continually scrolling down, I went, I, uh, I just grabbed the first 100 set them aside and decided I needed to learn more. So that began a very long uh, process of teaching myself as much as I could about, uh, you know, genomics and DNA. And um, one of the first things I found out was chromosome number one's longest chromosome of all of them. <laughs> it was something like 20 million uh, nucleotides or pairs. And so I just, as a composer, wanted to work with those first hundred nucleotides. And I basically sonified them, which meant just simply finding, um, uh, creating a little matrix whereby I could just get those four pitches. So it was fairly limited um, pitch-wise. But what I was interested in was seeing if there were any recurring patterns and um, what that would bring, because as a musician, I'm trained to hear patterns and see patterns. and um, I was fascinated that it was always shifting. It was hard to actually find any sort of patterns, and that fascinated me even more. Uh, I'm, so I worked on my genome music on two prongs. One was as a composer, and one was as a, a learning process to learn more of the hard science of the DNA. Um, and I would shift back and forth. Uh, and one of the first things I did was take those hundred nucleotides, use the four pitches, but expand and contract by, uh, by either half or four, you know, by very simple Pythagorean ratios, if you will. Uh, the, the rhythm of them you make them twice as long, four times as long, three times as long. I would change the octaves, an octave higher, an octave lower, and just basically played as a composer with those various simple rhythms and pitch relationships. And that's what became genome music number one. As I delved deeper into it, I started, of course, learning more about uh, amino acids, and uh, there's like uh, you know twenty some odd amino acids. So I was able to, now to sonify those and have a much larger pitch range. And um, as I worked on that, I also found out, like for instance, insulin only has like three hundred and thirty amino acids, and to form insulin. And so that was something that was actually complete in itself and could be heard in human time. Two million nucleotides would take forever, no matter how fast I played them. <laughs> you know? So with insulin, I was able to um, take just the amino acids, map it to a program I use called MetaSynth, which is a photograph, it's like Photoshop for sound and lets me draw on the screen uh, or print onto the screen, and then so each pixel is its own sound. So I was able to basically map the insulin amino acid pattern onto the screen and then sonify it. And then what I did, once again, I brought my composerly ear to it, in order to not just to have it going beep, 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 
I was able to apply a blur, which you would often do in Photoshop, which feathered the edges of all of these and then slowed it down. So it was this ever um, gradually shifting uh, ocean of sound. To a certain extent, choosing the pitches is arbitrary on one level, as I might choose a scale or a tuning system with which to span those 20 amino acids. Arbitrary in that initial thing, in that initial choice, but the relationships between them remain solid and clear. And I've worked not only with pitches, but also for um, another um, amino acid. I worked with Terry Longshore, who's the um, chairman of the music department and head of percussive studies here. And we created a 20, uh, basically an amino acid array of percussion instruments. And, you know, there's certain amino acids that are hydrophobic. They like, they don't want water, so they live deep inside the protein. And uh, that became like a large gong in the center of this array. And there are others that are, uh, you know, lighter weight or want more air. And so we created a percussive array that, in a sense, on a metaphorical level, mimicked the various amino acids and their tendencies and their relationships. And this took weeks, maybe months, to fine tune and learn more and choose these things, uh, choose these sounds, both from a scientific point of view, what we knew of the amino acids and their various proclivities, and from, of course, our composerly ears. But once we got the array, then all Terry basically had to do was play the printout of the amino acid. So uh, it was uh, a fascinating exploration. And this is um, something that we presented in Toronto, at the University of Toronto, for um, a, a great um, conference that happens every year that's based on science and art. My initial impulse was with this, pro well, what became the project, its initial impulse was just my sense of wonder and with experimenting with new, um, with new patterns, with new ways of patterning, um, hoping, of course, you know, that maybe as a musician and composer, I could somehow, in a very tiny way, contribute my patterning instincts to uh, this research. So I was just exploring this for my own wonder, and I sent it off to Lucy Edwards at KSOR Public Radio, Jefferson Public Radio, just to see if she would be interested in it as just sort of a, you know, interesting piece, because I thought it was interesting. And that's about as far as I went. I it was immediately back exploring, and a few days later she says, oh, I'd love to do a piece. So she came over and we talked about that and before I knew it like within a week it was up on some server in Seattle and her piece on this genome music was going up and down the west coast and a week after that Bob Edwards called me from NPR and I was on you know morning edition and from that I ended up at the Smithsonian Institute doing a lecture for the first uh, for a large uh, genome project conference that was there in 2000 in June of 2001 and that was just phenomenal because I got to meet Francis Collins, who was the head of NIH for the Genome Project, and people from all over the world uh, that were working on this. And they were, the conference was coming at it from all aspects, from uh, the you know commercial labs to NIH um, to. Um, people like myself that were looking at it artistically and just trying to blend and learn from each other. It was one of the most exciting opening conferences I've been at.